It's very nice to meet you. My name is Wilson Turner. I'm a 2022 Astronaut Scholarship recipient, and it's my distinct honor to introduce Dr. John Grunsfeld. There are a million different things, like we said, about John that you can see on his Wikipedia page. Uh, but one thing that's not on his Wikipedia page is that on his second space shuttle mission, he actually called into NPR's Car Talk and described the issues that his government vehicle was having. <laughs> Unfortunately, they didn't know how to clean the carbon dioxide scrubber um, based on their car experience, uh, but luckily John was able to figure it out. Um, but without further ado, Dr. John Grensfeld. All right, well, thanks very much for coming. Uh, I have a lot of material to cover. Uh, thanks for some of the, my fellow astronauts to come and, and hear this story. Oh, somehow we got to uh, the next slide. Um, I'm going to tell you a tale of two telescopes, uh, one of which you know, many of the astronauts who are here have had uh, a part of either developing or launching or servicing. Um, the Hubble Space Telescope, I was able to fly on three of the five servicing flights. I'll tell you a little bit about that. And I'm also a Hubble observer. I'm an astronomer, astrophysicist, uh, formally, and uh, it's really a thrill to use the telescope. And the other is the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, you know, these are really our two premier observatories right now. Um, the role that I had uh, most recently was as Deputy Director of Space Telescope Science Institute, where for two years I helped develop the Operations Center uh, and the science program for the James Webb Space Telescope. And then foolishly, uh, I went to NASA headquarters, and for four and a half years, uh, I was Associate Administrator for Science, uh, and part of my responsibilities were both Hubble and developing the James Webb Space Telescope. And my time at headquarters was uh, particularly difficult because you know, NASA goes through administration changes, policy changes, and they always come up with a mission statement, and we're supposed to memorize it. And, and unlike most astronauts, as a scientist, you know, I really didn't like having to wrote memorize mission statements, so I came up with my own. So I think NASA's mission is to innovate, explore, discover, and inspire. And we innovate, we create technology uh, that enables us to go out and explore. And when we explore, whether it's the cosmos or the Earth, the sun, our solar system, uh, sending people out beyond low Earth orbit, which I hope we do again soon, we discover things. It's actually some scientific basis that the human genome has some genes uh, that drive us to explore. And not everybody's genes are expressed, uh, you know, are turned on. You know, there's some people who are just happy to to stream you know, all kinds of uh, you know, series videos and sit at home. And there's some people who can't sit at home. They have to go out. They have to explore. You know, those are the folks that when you go on a hike and you say, OK, we're going to turn around at, at noon, um, you get to noon and they see a, a bend in the trail. And they say, we have to go on. We have to see what's beyond that bend. Um, when we discover things, it makes us feel good. And again, I think that's genetically encoded. It's part of the human experience because it inspires us. It drives us. It drives us for further exploration, further discovery. And for NASA, you know, we inspire the nation and the world. In the science realm, we get to ask amazing questions. And these are not detailed questions. These are not, you know, you know, some engineering question about the strength of a particular new material or something like that. Those are interesting, important questions. But we ask big questions. Where did we come from? Where did the universe come from? Where did the chemical elements that we're made out of come, f come from? How did stars form, galaxies, planetary systems, uh, planets, Earth? Where did life come from on Earth? Where are we going? What's the future of the universe? And I don't want to scare you. Um, Maybe we should close the door so nobody runs out screaming. Um, the Andromeda Galaxy, our, one of our nearest neighbors, our largest uh, near neighbor, uh, is going to collide with the Milky Way imminently. <laughs> now, the good news is when galaxies collide, and I'll show you an image later, stars don't hit stars and planets don't hit planets. Now, stars get ejected and planets get shut out due to gravitational interactions, but the galaxies pretty much merge as they do a delicate dance around each other to create a mega galaxy. But you don't have to worry about that. That's five billion 
years off. And we really are on a direct collision course. We've measured that now. It's incredible the precision that we're going to smash into each other. Um, and the reason why you don't have to worry about it five billion years from now is because long before then, the sun is going to expand and burn the earth to a crisp. <laughs> but that's about a billion years off, so I wouldn't worry much about that either. Um, but not only where is the universe going, what's What's the trajectory of the climate of planet Earth? That's something that NASA science does, and it's not good. Um, that's a much bigger concern. And where are we going as humans? And you know, the current program of record, which is very exciting, is we're going to go back to the moon, and I really want us to go to Mars. I think that human uh, exploration on the surface of Mars will be much better at answering that question of, did Mars ever start? Did life ever start on Mars? And do we see any evidence that there could be current life on Mars? And then that's the final question is, are we alone? And this is what drives me and my research is the question of, can we find evidence of life beyond Earth? Now, I started out when I went to headquarters with the goal of trying to find intelligent life on Earth. And I've since ruled that out. <laughs> the in really incredible thing about this NASA scientific voyage, if you will, that started with the dawn of the space age and the very first rockets that lofted scientific satellites is since then we've been able to tell the story of the whole universe starting, uh, and there were telescopes and scientists before that that contributed to this, but from the moment of some kind of event, we call it the Big Bang, it actually wasn't a bang, but the creation of the universe 13.8 billion years ago incredible uh, inflation, the size of the universe grew, you know, orders and orders of magnitude in just a matter of, of seconds and then minutes, up to 400,000 years when matter and radiation decoupled. So the universe got big enough that a photon of light could run through the universe without hitting a proton, a hydrogen atom, and left an imprint of the early universe on the cosmic background radiation. Now, I have to look at the audience and gauge the age, usually, and in this case, uh, I can say what I usually say, which is, you remember when we had our TVs, uh, and they were analog, and antennas, and rabbit ears, and there were three or four channels between network stations? When you clicked through there, you had static. Well, we've learned that about half of that static was caused by the microwave radiation traveling through the universe. And so you've all actually seen this background radiation, but we've sent up satellites that have really measured it in great detail and looked at the characteristics of the fluctuations and the scale size between fluctuations. And we've learned you know, things about the universe. And then there's something called the dark ages where there really wasn't uh, there were no stars and the matter had cooled enough that it literally was dark. There were some photons, microwave photons running around, um, but nothing that would create light. And then at some point, and this diagram is already out of date because it says about 400 million years after the Big Bang, enough of the hydrogen, helium, and lithium had come together. Hydrogen, helium, lithium were the only elements in the universe until stars. Some of that matter came together, collapsed, and fusion turned on inside, and we had the first stars. James Webb has already pushed this back uh, probably a couple hundred million years. Um, and the universe has been expanding ever since, and galaxies form, structure forms, planets form, stars go supernova. Uh, the material from the supernova forms new stars. Uh, about halfway through the age of the universe, star formation was at its maximum. And then at some point, about four or five billion years ago, our sun formed, our planetary system formed, the Earth formed, and remarkably, only about half a billion years later, life started on Earth. Or life was imported to Earth. We don't know. Um, but here we are on planet Earth, and, and we've been able to tell that story in great detail, and it's a phenomenal uh, achievement of the space program. We also learned that the universe is not only expanding, and you know, everybody thought, well, it will expand, probably come to a stop, and then there'll be a big crunch, or it will expand forever, but it will continuously slow down because gravity pulls on, on everything. Turns out the, the universe is accelerating, and we have no clue why. Um, 
So it's an amazing story that we've been able to tell. And part of that is Edwin Powell Hubble. Uh, Edwin Powell Hubble was an American astronomer. He lived uh, 1889 to 1953. Um, this is a telescope on Mount Palomar. It's the 48-inch Schmidt camera. And number one, you're not supposed to smoke pipes around a telescope. <laughs> and number two, he never actually used that telescope. But he used the 100-inch telescope on top of Mount Wilson. Uh, you can see Mount Wilson uh, now uh, if you sit in LA and look up towards uh, the mountains. And it had a big telescope on it. And he observed these weird things called nebulae. This is a picture of a nebula, a cloud. Um, he, we knew that these were stars. They thought these were clouds of gas and dust. And there is gas and dust in there. Um, fortunately, we have Photoshop, so we can invert the image. So it's more familiar to what we look at. This is a glass plate, so like a 4 by 5 glass plate covered with silver iodide emulsion. And he would sit in the telescope, the prime uh, focus of the telescope with a little XY guider um, and guide the telescope on some stars and then expose this film, if you will, for a long time, you know, an hour or two, and then give it to a technician. They would develop it and, you know, that image would come out. And they were trying to figure out what these were. And one of the interesting things is there were some pulsating stars. They're called Cepheid variables. And their pulsation rate is proportional to the brightness, intrinsic brightness. And we see that because we have a lot of them in our own galaxy. But he saw it in this cloud. And so he's able to measure the brightness. And so if I have a 100 watt light bulb and I take it four times further away from you, it'll be 1 16th as bright. If I take it five times away from you, it'll be 1 25th as bright. So he was able to figure out that this cloud was super far away, like ridiculously far away and that it actually wasn't a cloud of gas and dust in our own, own universe, our galaxy. It was another island universe. Well, island universe is not a very catchy phrase. And so somebody came up with the idea of calling it a galaxy, and that stuck. And we now know that we live in a universe filled with galaxies. So he measured about three dozen galaxy velocities using physics, using spectroscopy, and came up with a surprising result that on average, all the galaxies are moving away from us. Well, we learned a long time ago that you know, the Earth isn't at the center of the solar system or the universe. And so that's an odd result if everything's moving away from you. And the only reasonable conclusion is that no matter where you are in the universe, distant things would be moving away from you because the whole universe is expanding. So Hubble discovered uh, that the universe is expanding. So that's why we named the Hubble Space Telescope after him. Now, the Hubble Space Telescope is not a particularly large telescope. Now, by backyard standards, yes. But by mountaintop standards, no. We have 10-meter telescopes, 33 feet across now, on top of Mauna Kea. You know, we have similar telescopes in Chile. Um, the Chinese now have, on the Chilean-Bhutan uh, border, 8-meter telescopes. Um, the Hubble Telescope is 2.4 meters across. You know, so you know, it would easily fit in this room. The whole telescope is about the size of a tour bus that we may be going to the Saturn V on, uh, you know, tomorrow. And, but it has a huge advantage. It cheats. It's above the atmosphere. Um, particularly in Florida, if you go out tonight and you look up at the night sky, uh, you'll see a full moon. You know, that's nice. You look at the stars, and the stars beautifully twinkle. Well, the stars twinkle because of our upper atmosphere causes the light to be bent as you look at the stars. And if you want to take a picture of things, uh, having the star kind of moving around means that they're going to be blurry. Not only that, ultraviolet light from stars, which is super important for physicists, gets filtered out by our atmosphere, which is good. Otherwise, we probably wouldn't be here because you know life would have been burned to a crisp. So, I mean, that's why we put sunscreen on and wear those very fashionable big floppy hats, right? <laughs> um, I expect to see you all out at the pool with big floppy hats. Um, so Hubble is above the atmosphere. So that allows it to see the ultraviolet light. And you know, as our, my fellow astros know here, when you look out the window from a spaceship or a visor of a, of a spacesuit, uh, extravehicular activity suit, 
the stars don't twinkle. And, and that's kind of a cool thing. Um, so Hubble can take super clear images. Plus, if you think about a telescope on a mountaintop that has to track the stars to accommodate the Earth's rotation, well, that has to have gears and motors, and that causes them to shake just a little bit. They're really good now, but that shaking is another blurring effect. Plus, the Earth is not quiet. The Earth has constantly got micro-earthquakes, or somebody drives by with a truck to come up to the observatory. That shakes the whole observatory. You try not to do that. And now, virtually every picture a ground-based telescope takes has Starlink satellites in it. And the projection is that pretty much ground-based astronomy is going to have photobombs of multiple satellites, every image, because there's a plan for about 100,000 low Earth orbit comsats so that we can have, you know, good internet. Um, so that's, wh that's what it is. So, you know, our, you know, kids and grandkids will grow up not knowing uh, about a dark sky and they will always think, oh, isn't that cool? The sky is filled with moving objects um, rather than constellations and stars and planets. Now, the Hubble is a great observatory by definition. It was out of the NASA Great Observatory Program. Um, but when it was launched in 1990 on Discovery, and I saw Charlie Bolden last night. He was the pilot on the mission. Uh, it was not a particularly great observatory. And it had nothing to do with the crew. You know, they didn't put a fingerprint on the mirror. Um, the deployment was great and it was challenging. And we got to the gr they got to the ground and we got to the Space Telescope Science Institute and the scientists looked at the images. And, and you expected, you know, the, the pre-programmed cheers from public affairs. And they did cheer, you know, but the the folks looking at it said, there's something seriously wrong with this telescope. That was really bad for NASA. 1990, we were trying to get a space station started, Space Station Freedom. Um, Congress funded the Hubble Space Telescope, which at that point was about, and in those year dollars, about $3 billion, big deal. And uh, the public lampooned Hubble, late night shows, comics. This is the moon looking like a peanut, weird Jupiters, wavy Saturn rings very angry taxpayers. And the reason the images weren't good is because the mirror, which was the best mirror ever produced by humans, the most smooth and perfect shape, uh, well, it was the perfect shape, it just was the wrong shape. And at the edge of the mirror, you know, if you, if you think of a, a curved mirror, the curvature was wrong by 1 40th the width of a human hair. And that was enough to cause something called spherical aberration, which is a fancy way of saying, when you look at a bright star, not all of the light went into this pinpoint star. Some of it was distributed in a halo around the star. And that's because the you know, light coming in bounced off, and instead of going to the focus, the stuff at the outside went to away from the focus. And that's bad. That means it was sort of a good observatory, not a great observatory. But because we could observe bright stars on orbit, you could invert that image and figure out exactly what the shape on orbit was and then put contact lenses on to correct it. Well, we don't use contact lenses. We use mirrors. So you think of if the, if the mirror was a little too flat, you could put in a mirror that has a little bit of curvature to exactly cancel that out. And so in 1993, uh, women and men in white suits rode to the rescue on the space shuttle with white space suits, did spacewalks to put in a corrective optics space telescope axial replacement, COSTAR, the corrective optics, and a brand new super duper digital camera that had those mirrors incorporated. And then the Hubble images were amazing. You can think of the first deep field image of all the galaxies or the pillars of creation, Eagle Nebula, you know, those things that we all love. And the Hubble was specifically designed to be serviced to be fixed by astronauts on space shuttles, to be launched by the space shuttle, to be fixed by astronauts going up on the space shuttle. And we did five servicing missions. Um, in 1997, a crew went up and put in a new spectrograph. I'll talk a little more about that. Fixed lots of things. Uh, on the first one, we also put on new solar rays. Then in 1999, we put in new gyros, an advanced computer. We went from something that was basically a 286 all the way to a 486. For those that remember, I'm glad I get some chuckles. And the 46 is still working great, and it still is enough power. Um, I don't know why we have to keep getting new laptops, but uh, <laughs> Hubble, Hubble isn't. And uh, 
we changed, really did a complete makeover uh, in 2002 of the telescope with new solar arrays, power control, uh, in some new camera, the advanced camera for surveys, which is incredible. And then uh, in 2006, well, 2003, we lost Columbia. And then NASA Administrator Sean O'Keefe said, uh, for the agency, you know, integrated risk for the agency, it's too risky to go to Hubble. And that's because Hubble is in a different orbit than the space station. If you go to the space station, and we did say we were going to return to flight and finish the assembly of the space station, if something goes wrong, you have a place to hang out. You have a cabin in space. And, and you can spend months up there, and we could send up Soyuz rockets with food, um, you know, and greeting cards and Christmas presents. And, you know, the crew could hang out. It'd be fun. Well, maybe. Be a little crowded. One toilet. Mm. Um, but for Hubble, you know, there's no toilet on Hubble. We have the doors, but nobody thought to put a space toilet in there. <laughs> Probably a good thing. Um, but anyway, so if we go up to Hubble, you know, at, you know, normally it's a two-week mission, and then you have a few days that you could stay. But if, if we had a problem like Columbia with a hole in the wing or, a, you know, the thermal protection uh, that got dinged by foam, we couldn't hang out there. Uh, so he decided we weren't going back. There was huge outcry. And, you know, to, to just summarize it, you know, a lot of folks felt if we're going to fly a space shuttle, we should do it for important things. And there were plenty of crew members who said we'd go. Um, in 2005, Mike Griffin was appointed NASA Administrator, and so he asked me and uh, Chuck Shaw, Flight Director, to uh, look at how could we uh, safely, more safely, no space flight is safe, go up to the Hubble, uh, have a rescue capability, and have the capability maybe to stay on orbit for 30 days. And so I worked that with him. We presented it back, and he said, we're going to go to Hubble. And then he told me, I'm going to go to Hubble. And in 2009, we went back to Hubble and did another complete makeover. And so 2009 May was the last time a crew went to the Hubble Space Telescope. And here we are, 2023, and everything is still working and operating. And I'm surprised because our warranty was only five years, labor included. And I, so I thought in 2014, the Hubble would die one day after the warranty expired, <laughs> just like everything else in life. Okay, I'm going to try and go through this quickly. You know, why telescopes? Well, what telescopes do is gather more light than our eyes so that we can see things that are further away and in greater detail. And the bigger the telescope, the more detail you can see. Now, Galileo did not invent the telescope. He took the telescope that was used to spy on neighbors and look for ships coming over the horizon that could be threatened and aimed it at the night sky. And you know, discovered lots of great things. He saw moons going around Jupiter. He saw the phases of Venus and figured out that Venus goes around the sun, not around the Earth, and gotten big trouble by the church for these ideas uh, for the rest of his life. Um, you know, they tried to get him to recant, and he said, I can't recant you know, scientific fact. Um, Fox News didn't exist. <laughs> but his, te his telescope, uh, gathered about 75, more, 75 times more light than our eyeball. And he kicked off a scientific revolution, the Renaissance, basically. And telescopes uh, kept getting bigger and bigger, uh, still lenses put together, until they got so big, you know, about four feet, that just the force of gravity pulling on the lenses would distort the optics. Glass is a kind of super slow liquid, if you will. And as you pointed the telescope around, they'd sag and make the images blurry. Um, at that point, it was about 10,000 times more light than our eyeball. And this is still when people would just sketch images. You'd look through and you'd sketch it. You know, we had canals and civilizations on Mars because of you know, the sketches of lines on Mars that turn out you know, don't really exist. But you can imagine they exist looking through a big telescope. And uh, then we switched to big mirrors. You know, people figured out why you could have reflective optics. And Newton actually drew telescopes like this, but people couldn't grind them. And so in the 1800s, we switched to huge mirrors. Eventually, the 100-inch uh, telescope on Mount Wilson, and then photography was born. And that allowed you, instead of looking through the eyepiece, to put the film and, and sit on an look at an object for hours. And that allowed you to collect a lot more light 
develop it and see pictures in more detail. The 200-inch uh, on Mount Palomar, which for a long time was the biggest telescope in the world, and the development of electronic detectors, charge-coupled devices, you know, the, and then later CMOS, the things that are in our phones. Um, and the Soviets made a six-meter telescope. It never really worked and hasn't ever worked. And then Hubble, which, as I said, cheats because it's above the atmosphere, so it can see better, collect more light, even though it's a small mirror, much smaller than the, the six meter or 200 inch. And, and we get up to you know, 100 billion times more collection than the human eye. And then the last service emission, we put in more sensitive detectors. And this has all allowed us to uh, you know, look at the earliest galaxies in the universe, see deep into the universe, um, to watch supernova explosions, to see planets forming around nearby stars, uh, to see the uh, evolution and life cycle of stars and galaxies, prove the existence of black holes, determine the origin of gamma ray bursts, you know, all kinds of amazing things you know, that resulted in at least one Nobel Prize, the 2011 Nobel Prize in Physics. Um, so the last mission, STS-125 uh, in May of 2009, uh, was led by Scott Altman. Scott's here. Um, in previous years, he's won the uh, Zarella's Cocktail Challenge. Um, <laughs> He felt bad about winning every year, uh, and so he stepped back this year and enjoyed the cocktails. Um, but you all know Scott for a different reason. Other than four space flights, two to the Hubble Space Telescope, two flights with me, um, prior to becoming an astronaut, he was an F-14 Tomcat pilot, and uh, he starred in a movie that never really amounted to very much um, <laughs> about uh, Top Gun. Uh, flyers in San Diego. He's a California fan. And uh, the actor who I, it escapes me his name right now. Um, I think that was his only movie. Uh, he did not fly the F-14 scenes. Scott Altman was the pilot uh, as a, a surrogate for, oh yeah, Tom Cruise. Um, and so the finger that you see in the film is actually Scott's. Uh, when he's inverted over the F-5, which is a MiG, supposed to be a MiG, and he's a friendly greeting to the Russians. Um, you know, I, I wonder when the, I, I think it was an Su-29 and the F-22 or whatever it was recently, you know, when they had a, an engagement over uh, in the Middle East, whether anybody, never mind. Um, our pilot, Greg Johnson, uh, aerospace engineer, he was also a, a, a NASA instructor pilot, uh, and uh, his first flight, Megan MacArthur, her first flight, she's a physical oceanographer. Uh, I was on my fifth flight, my spacewalking partner, Drew Feustel, a geologist, his first flight. Uh, Mike Good, a, uh, an Air Force B-2 uh, flight engineer uh, and Air Force colonel on his first flight and Mike Massimino on his second flight. And Mike Massimino, Scott Altman and myself flew on the previous Hubble mission, so we had some carryover. And that's kind of a tradition that you bring the experience, make sure we don't break the Hubble with training uh, new folks. Uh, Drew and I were spacewalking partners for EVA's spacewalks one, three, and five. We did five spacewalks, and Mike and Mike were spacewalkers on the second and fourth spacewalks. Um, and so we could tell them apart. Mike Massimino is mass, and uh, Mike Good is bueno. I never understood that, but you know, you have to learn the subtleties of these call signs. Uh, we went out to the launch pad. Endeavor was our rescue vehicle, so it was all prepared and had a separate crew. Uh, we were on Atlantis, so we had to make sure to turn left when we went to the launch pad. Right, let's go. On launch day, we wear those orange suits. Those are uh, partial pressure suits, so in case the shuttle loses atmosphere, as it did on uh, Challenger, you know, we have a chance to, to get a little more time and then uh, we climb into the vehicle, make sure it's Atlantis. We have parachutes so that we can jump out in those pressure suits. Really? <laughs> we're going Mach 10, the shuttle breaks up, and you know, we're going to jump out. Could but it makes us feel better. On behalf of the KSC it takes about 10,000. That's Mike Leinbach, the launch director. The it takes about 10,000 people mission, all doing their jobs right before you can get a shuttle to the days. launch pad. And it's remarkable how well it does. Oh, look, a flame trench. Um, About five seconds before launch, we get the engines all set. We light the solid rocket motors. Then we're going somewhere. The computers know where we're going. That was the master alarm. That's a bad thing. 
for the first two and a half minutes, it's an incredibly rough ride on the solid rocket motor. You can see all the turbulence. We're just pushing a blunt object through the atmosphere. If we get rid of those solid rocket motors, and we have cameras on everything now, uh, we get to see the shuttle going away. Those uh, boosters will you know, slowly rotate. Parachutes will come out. They'll land in the ocean. They were reused. Um, the only thing we threw away, uh, besides you know a few items in, in the shuttle, uh, was the external tank, which is basically a beer can. The super lightweight tank was incredibly light. Once we got to orbit, eight and a half minutes later, we're going uh, a little over 17,500 miles an hour. We open the payload bay doors, and we check out all the gear that survived launch, nothing floating out, you know that kind of thing. It's amazing, the engineering that goes into this. This is all our gear to service the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, now, just a little uh, plug for the space shuttle system. Incredibly complex. You know, it, it doesn't look like a normal rocket. So the aerodynamics of pushing that through the atmosphere while the rockets are running, the acoustics, the vibration, everything. Um, it's just phenomenal to me. You know that the very you know the engineers in the 1970s with IBM 360 computers, um, punch cards, printouts, slide rules, and really big intelligent brains. Uh, coming off of Apollo, figured out how to launch that system. And uh, John Young and Robert Crippen got on it the first time and had a successful mission. It, you know, I really salute you know, the whole team uh, and the, uh, you know, the uh, risk tolerance uh, for those two astronauts to get on that first vehicle and that it was successful. And then recently we had the SLS Artemis I mission, uh, Artemis I, Artemis II, whatever it was, the first uh, full up uh, SLS Orion mission, and it was successful. You know, it takes a lot of engineering to learn about all the margins and then try and fly a test vehicle that explores some of the edges of those envelopes, but, but to be successful. Um, really, really incredible. And this is the most reusable space system ever built. You know, if you look at the percentage of stuff that went up and came back, this is the most reusable space vehicle. We flew 135 times. Sadly, two were unsuccessful, uh, Columbia and Challenger. Once we get to orbit, uh, Scott Altman flew uh, Atlantis underneath the Hubble that allowed Megan MacArthur to reach out with a robotic arm, grab it, put it into a fixture on the payload bay, and uh, I was able to get dressed to go spacewalking. Hopefully, you can see a few cool things in this picture. That's the Earth reflected in my polycarbonate thin visor. Um, I'm basically a spaceship uh, at this point. Uh, my backpack has oxygen, power, CO2 scrubbing, emergency oxygen pack, electronics. Um, there's a really simple computer that's a 1970s vintage design um, in, in the front with some controls. Um, the writing is backwards, so you can use a mirror and look at it. Uh, all the tools are tethered. I have high and low beam lights. There are three cameras that you'll see. And it's just an amazing system. And I love this more than anything else I've ever done is going out spacewalking, which is pretty insane because out here is a vacuum. Humans cannot survive in a vacuum. Uh, here's the wing of the space shuttle, the gear, and I'm in a cloth suit. But it does explain why through much of my uh, adult life, people had said, John, do you work in a vacuum? <laughs> um, and I absolutely love this. And you can see a big grin on my face. And for most of the flight, I had a big grin on my face. Now, for scale, uh, you saw the red stripes. This is me. This is Drew Feustel on the end of the robotic arm. We have like ski bindings. And uh, Megan could drive him around. And he's holding a wrench. And I'm not smiling. And I'm not smiling because the Wide Field Camera 2 that was installed in 1993, uh, the astronauts who uh, installed it, you know, often Jeff Hoffman is here and I can make fun of him. Um, but they torqued it in too tight. And we didn't know that. So we had a torque wrench with settings, and we couldn't unscrew the bolt that holds it in. And I thought, I can't believe we've come this far. This new camera that we have in the payload bay is the super duper camera that's going to unravel the mysteries of the universe. Hubble was canceled, put back on. You know, we risked a launch. We get to orbit. We get the Hubble, and we're not going to get the super duper digital camera in. Um, and you might say, well, you know, sure, it'll come out. Just put more force on it. 
But the engineers who designed it were really quite brilliant because the bolt is where we interface on the outside of the telescope, and there's a long shaft. It's about four feet long. And if you put too much torque on that shaft and the screw part of it that goes into a nut uh, exceeds the force of the shear strength of the bolt, it'll shear off right where the screws are. And if that happened, you could get the old camera out, but there'd be screw left in the nut, and you couldn't get the new camera in. And you'd have a big gaping hole, and that would be the end of Hubble. So they said, we don't want that to happen. So they uh, machined out a thin section in the middle of the bolt such that it would break there instead that would have a feature that would keep the old camera in the Hubble forever, but at least it would protect the Hubble. And that shear strength is at 58 foot-pounds. So one, a wrench of one foot long with 58 pounds of force would shear that, and we would never get the, the new camera in. And we were already up to 45 foot-pounds with the torque wrench, and it wasn't turning. And we had to take the torque protection off, and then Drew had to try and turn it. Well, you know, we had a lot of discussion with the ground. I called car talk. They couldn't help. Um, <laughs> We actually had hundreds of people on the ground working this problem. And we had a checklist that said what to do. And the very last step says, well, you have no other choices. You just go for it. And so Drew went for it. And uh, he pulled on the wrench. And suddenly, you know, the force went to zero. You know, so he goes, and it turned a little bit. And Drew said, I got it. And I said, yeah, it turned. <laughs> And you know, at that point, we didn't know whether it had broken or would come out. But fortunately, when he put the power tool on and it started spinning it fast, I saw it coming out. And if you ever listen to the video, you hear me go, yoo-hoo. That's about as excited <laughs> as, as I get. But I was smiling again. Um, the next a couple of days later, we did uh, a repair on an instrument that's a first ever of its kind. But I want to show you this, because this is the view out Drew's helmet, showing you the doors. This is the removal of that corrective optics because all the new instruments have it built in. Uh, Drew took that out. Uh, you saw him give a little thumbs up, because every time in training he tried to take it out, it would get jammed. Um, and we had to learn how to, how to do that. It weighs about 800 pounds, so I convinced him to go to the gym every day for three years. Um, and actually, that's true, because even though in space it's weightless, it still has that inertia, and so you don't want to let go of it. We then went in and did brain surgery on an instrument, that's what it's been called, to remove tiny screws and four circuit cards from the advanced camera for surveys, which had failed. And people have never done this before. And how do you take tiny screws out in space? You use a tiny screwdriver. And I, you know, I can talk more about this, but we had to build a contraption so the screws wouldn't float away after I loosened them. You can see them floating around there. And then the circuit cards are super sharp edges, so we had to develop this guy to be able to pull the cards out um, if they were stuck, and so I wouldn't touch them. And so we pulled out those cards. We had to cut through aluminum grids, you know, all kinds of gymnastics, if you will, or a pommel horse. Uh, mm -hmm. To get those cards out, Drew was taking the old ones out. We inserted new cards, closed it all out, and, uh, and fixed the advanced camera for surveys. Here we are over the Baja Peninsula, traveling five miles a second over the Earth, uh, just cleaning up. Uh, this is coming in after that repair, bringing our tools in. It's kind of cool when you bring those, the tool belt in. For a long time, it's super cold. Uh, it's kind of neat. I came in. Um, since my wife's not here, I can say it. This is the hap really the happiest moment of my life. <laughs> um, when my wife's here, it's the fourth happiest moment. Marrying her, my daughter, my son, and then fixing the advanced camera for surveys. Um, and one of the reasons is because most of you know we have lots of review teams at NASA, senior review teams at headquarters, review teams at Goddard Space Flight Center, Johnson Space Flight Center. And unanimously, they said, do not repair the advanced camera. It's too hard. It will take too long. You won't be successful. You will have wasted six to eight hours of spacewalking time, uh, and you won't bring it back. There's just too much risk of damaging the inside of the ACS, not getting the cards out, taking too long. We actually had two days potentially scheduled for it. And uh, Drew and I developed um, you know, a really tight choreography. Um, and I predicted it would take two hours and 30 minutes. In fact, walking to the launch pad, we were shaking hands. And the EVA lead 
Um, I walked by and I said, two hours and 30 minutes. And he said, what? And I said, two hours and 30 minutes. Uh, <laughs> and I, he said, what? And I said, ACS repair. And he goes, yeah, sure. <laughs> two hours and 32 minutes. <laughs> um, I dawdled. What can I say? Um, and the advanced camera survey works. And observations with the advanced camera resu resulted in the 2011 Nobel Prize in Physics. So I'm pretty happy with that. If it hadn't have been successful, uh, I wouldn't be here talking to you. Um, I, th someplace with no extradition. Um, we also repaired the Space Telescope Imaging Spectrograph. That's Mike Good and Mike Massimino. There were some struggles there. Uh, he wrote a book uh, about that. You can, you can see that. This is, you know, Mass is 6'2 or 6'3, and he's inside the telescope. Um, so that's, again, a, a thing of scale. And I'm really glad they fixed that because this is the instrument, the STIS, Space Telescope Imaging Spectrometer, that I use for my research. Uh, the last day, uh, we did some other repairs. This is a sort of baby grand piano size instrument called a fine guidance sensor. It's an interferometer. We put new insulation on the outside of the telescope. We replaced batteries, a couple of other minor items on that last day. Closed it all up, and uh, that allowed Megan MacArthur the next day to put Hubble on the robotic arm, deploy it, and we saw Hubble drifting off into space with the door open, ready to do observations. Um, that allowed us to get together for a meal. I like to hang upside down, although to me, everybody else is upside down. This is the mid-deck of the space shuttle, kind of crowded. Uh, we don't have a whole space station. Uh, this is Drew making a, a chicken sandwich. We use tortillas um, because bread makes too many crumbs. We learned that on Gemini. So now we use tortillas. That's shrimp cocktail. Everything's in, in little bags, and almost everything's rehydrated. My son wanted me to take a picture of a ball of water. Um, being a physicist, a ball of water is a convex lens. It should magnify and invert the image. Uh, so I focused on the image. Drew's nose is not nearly that big. <laughs> and then I said, hey, Drew, get really close. Uh, yep, so you know, like Sherlock Holmes, you know, with a looking into his eyeball. I love looking out the window. Uh, this is over the coast of Africa, the Cape Verde Islands. You can see these are green, and that's uh, Saharan Desert. And the wind blowing over them is making these cool vortices. They're called von Karman vortices. And they go on you know, for 100 kilometers. You can see the Hubble Space Telescope worm, the NASA logo, is getting a little beat up. And uh, sunrises and sunsets, this happens to be a sunrise. Um, Think about this later with James Webb. Uh, we'd already deployed the Hubble. This is the Earth's atmosphere, and the height of the color you see uh, is about 100 kilometers. I think Jeff Hoffman once spent time with binoculars, and they identified 32 or so different color levels. But we live in the f only the lowest five kilometers of the atmosphere. So you hear people talk about how thin and fragile the atmosphere is. You know, This is a pictorial illustration. But as an astronomer, what this tells us is um, you know, we've s in the last 20 years, we've discovered that virtually every star in the night sky has a solar system around it. You know, and that's just amazing and cool because as a kid, I always wondered, you know, are there other planets out there? Is anybody else out there? You know, which of those stars has planets around it? And now we know virtually every star has planets around it. But if we want to study those planets, we can study the atmosphere of those planets by looking at the starlight that goes through the atmosphere and use a telescope like Hubble to look at the characteristics of the light that's absorbed by the atmosphere. And you can figure out what's in the atmosphere. But when we do that, we're just looking at this thin, thin sliver of the atmosphere around a planet around a nearby star. So I'll show you some of that. Now, the weather in Florida was terrible. Um, Roy Bridges had already retired. So the weather in Florida was terrible for landing. So we had some time just to play on orbit. That's a ball of orange drink, which afterwards we asked, hey, what kind of drink? They said, of course, it's Tang. <laughs> but it's government contracting, so you never actually know. That was uh, Bueno, my good, getting a, a ball of water to eat. Uh, Mass and I did some serious physics experiments. This is the rotation of solid bodies about various axes and conservation of angular momentum. Now, while we were doing that, uh, Scott Altman, Ray J, and, and Megan were up on the flight deck uh, playing video games. You know, <laughs> this is the uh, Land the Space Shuttle video game. 
It's actually a, a very accurate uh, flight simulator, and we have a hand controller, whoop, hand controller that Scott used. We get the data from that, and it's because he'd been on orbit for two weeks. It had been about three weeks since he had flown the, the shuttle simulator, and we wanted him to be good for landing. Uh, we were told not to go to Florida. Of course, we could see a big air mass system. We went to California, so he put on the San Diego, California music. Megan said, get to work. <laughs> and we did. Uh, 5,000 miles from the coast of California, you know, we uh, have a deorbit burn. We come in, we're smashing into the atmosphere using the bottom of the space shuttle as a break. Uh, 2,000 degree plasma outside, you can see that flashing. About 500 miles from the coast of California, we picked up the coast and then Edwards Air Force Base, uh, Armstrong Research Center. Uh, here we are going through 12,000 feet, about 350 miles an hour, 21 degrees nose down, and Scott's manually flying uh, to uh, you know, a beautiful landing on that uh, three mile runway. Uh, 300 feet, we put the landing gear down, and then right on center line, Scott uh, put us down on speed, uh, beautiful landing. We put out a parachute, a drag chute, not to slow down, but so when the nose gear hits, it doesn't hit too hard. And then slowly apply the brakes. We had great brakes, roll to a stop. Um, I think we orbited the Earth 197 times, 5.3 million miles. We grabbed the Hubble, did five spacewalks, released the Hubble, came home, rolled to a stop. And the big question always is, did we fix the Hubble or did we break the Hubble? And you don't know until you get back and they've turned on you know, the imagers, but again, I would be in exile in Bolivia, not here talking to you. And so this is an image of Hubble with the new super duper di digital camera. It's an extended object that's in our galaxy. It's a collection of gas and dust. This is taken in the light of uh, nitrogen, oxygen, sulfur, and hydrogen. We have specific filters, colored filters we put in the telescope in a wheel and we, t we take sequential pictures and stack them to get the color just like your phone does, it takes three pictures, every three simultaneous pictures when you push click, a red, green, blue one, and then the computer inside puts them on top of each other. And this is a region where a baby star is forming. And inside this gas and dust, we can't see it, is a brand new star, it's about 10 to 20 million years old, it's called a wolf Rayet star, um, after the, the people who discovered it. And it has a characteristic that it sends out these jets of material so if uh, this is the star and it's rotating like this and dust and gas are being pulled into the star, some of that gets shot out, the poles. And so it's spinning it around a uh, disk like this and stuff is getting shot out, but we can't see it. Um, this gas and dust blocks out the stars behind it. These are nearby stars. Some of them are probably formed in other gas and dust recently. At the tip of this, there's probably another star that hasn't turned on yet. And you can see these are Hubble images because they have this characteristic diffraction spike due to the secondary mirror structure uh, that holds that. And so light is diffracted. You, got, you always can tell a, you know, these Hubble images. Um, this is another region similar. And uh, in that super duper digital camera, we have not only a visible light camera, like what we see with, but an infrared camera and it's a detector that was developed for the James Webb Space Telescope. We flew it in 2009 on Hubble, along with the electronics for the James Webb to test it all out. And like Superman X-ray vision, infrared is actually what you really want. It can see through that ghostly, out, here's the ghostly outline of that gas and dust. Here's the baby star, here are those jets. Um, and we can also see through that gas and dust. So this proved that, yes, uh, James Webb will be able to see things Hubble can't see. Um, going forward and you know lots of you know nice stars. The other thing Hubble did was break the distance record in 2015 actually observations the paper was 2016 for this weird blobby thing which is actually a gal whole galaxy at a redshift of 11.1 .1 at 400 million years old. So we already know going into James Webb that the, the universe started much faster than we expected or the whole model is wrong we don't actually know. Um, but the model is so complete and tells the story almost exactly as we see it. But it's that almost part, you know, that's the mystery. Um, and so galaxies weren't nice spiral galaxies back then. Oh, and in this picture, um, everything in this picture is a galaxy. 50 to 
you know, hundreds of billions of stars, and there are 10,000 galaxies in this picture. If you walk up to it and you say, okay, well, what about this, you know, little speck right there? That's got to be just, you know, noise. That's a piece of dust. Nope. That's got 50 billion stars in it, and it's halfway to the beginning of the universe because it took the light so long to get here. But th that may not be, you know, the science may not even be the biggest contribution of Hubble. This is a picture of the Orion, Great Nebula in Orion, the Orion Nebula. If you think about Orion, you know, you got the three stars in the belt, you have the sword, three stars. That middle star in the sword is actually not a star at all, but it's a star forming region, it's a stellar nursery. And all throughout here, you can see the glow of baby stars that have been born, but the stars haven't blown out uh, you know, their cocoon yet. Um, this one has almost pushed away all the gas and dust that formed it from just starlight pressure. Um, and five billion years ago, we were born in something like this. But it's also just incredibly beautiful. You know, we can see the structure and the color and the depth and the richness of this image. And it's even better when you see it in a dark room or on your computer with a better screen. Um, and so Hubble has shown us that the universe isn't just points of light, that our universe is really a beautiful and rich place. And we never really imagined that until we got above the atmosphere and could see with this kind of clarity. Uh, last month, we celebrated April 24th, the uh, deployment of the Hubble Space Telescope, 33rd anniversary. Uh, we like to put out a picture for the anniversary picture, and so this is a picture in our galaxy. It's a little bit of a dark picture, and I don't know if they chose that, you know, because they were thinking, well, James Webb is getting all the news these days, as you know, in a in a stormy mood. But it's it's kind of a cool, you know, picture again showing you know the diversity and richness of the universe. So why did we name the James Webb Space Telescope after James Webb? He was an American, you know, bureaucrat. Uh, he was the director of the Office of Budget, now Office of Management and Budget, OMB. And usually, NASA folks don't like OMB because they're the ones that you know, say, oh, you can't have all the money you want. You, you, know, can't, you can't build your you know, lunar lander or your next telescope, or may, maybe in another decade. Um, but he was also the NASA administrator through the 1960s and really shepherded the Apollo program from inception you know, Mer post-Mercury, Gemini, Apollo test program. Um, you know, he was not NASA administrator when we flew, I think it was 1966 or so, and the administration changed. But, uh, you know, he was responsible for NASA during that period. But more importantly, you know, he frequently went to uh, Jerry Wiesner, the president's science advisor, and uh, President Kennedy while he was alive, and then Johnson. You know, and I sort of imagine him banging the table, although I think when you're with the president, you don't actually bang the table. Uh, certainly not, not in this day and age. But he argued effectively for making sure that science was an integral part of NASA, that it would be cemented in, that if we went to the moon safely and, and returned our crew back, that that would be a great achievement. Um, but it wouldn't have any longevity unless it had some deeper scientific meaning that would advance the country. And this followed on uh, a fellow named Vannevar Bush, who after World War II wrote a document called the Science, the Endless Frontier, that talked about how science, the science that we used to win World War II, radars and you know, better bomb trajectory things, and, and sadly even the atomic bomb, that science could be harnessed to improve human lives, human health, the economy, uh, space exploration eventually. And so James Webb translated that into NASA science. And he's really, I think, r principally responsible for making sure that that was you know, encoded into the DNA of, uh, of NASA. And so Sean O'Keefe, who was also an OMB guy uh, and NASA administrator, decided long before the telescope was finished to name it after James Webb. Um, there's a lot of controversy about that now, and I can talk about that later uh, if anybody wants, but I think there really is no evidence that James Webb was, uh, you know, personally a bad guy or that his policies were, you know. You know, you have to think about the context of the 1960s. Now, another NASA, administ whoop, another Na NASA administrator, uh, Dan Golden, who we all know and love, um, was at an American Astronomy, uh, Astronomical Society meeting in 1996, and 
in science, the National Academy of Sciences gives NASA guidance, not direction, but guidance on what NASA should do next based on scientific community input. And the science community said, following Hubble, uh, we would like to have an infrared telescope to go where no Hubble could go, to see where no Hubble could see. And we think, uh, you know, given NASA's budget, maybe a four meter telescope. And Dan Golden said, why do you ask for such a modest thing? Why not go after six or seven meters? Now that's not normally what NASA administrators say. They say, well, you know, thanks for uh, you know, putting a four meter telescope on your Christmas list. And uh, if you're good boys and girls, you know, maybe you, know, you can get something. Um, but he said, no, that's not ambitious enough. Go for uh, six or seven meters. He got a standing ovation. And in fact, James Webb Space Telescope is a six and a half meter telescope. And it would not have been if it weren't for uh, Dan Golden saying, you know, go for the gusto. James Webb is a very different telescope than Hubble. And I'm not going to go through all the technologies. But at the time it was approved, we did not know we could build it. And what the main reason is that uh, if you want to see infrared light, uh, your telescope and detectors and electronics has to be colder than the objects you're looking at. And the reason I say that is if you think about those cameras, you know, where you can look at people, you know, and, you know, some people have a cold nose or dogs have cold nose. You can see the, you know, eyeball sockets are a little colder and maybe the cheeks are, are bright red, you know, because they're hotter. That's infrared light. Infrared light sees heat. And so if you have a hot telescope like Hubble, Hubble is a room temperature, you know, 68 degree uh, telescope, it emits infrared photons. That's the heat radiation. And so if you want to see the heat radiation or the distant universe in infrared light, you have to make sure your telescope isn't glowing in infrared photons. So we knew that to do what we wanted to do, we had to cool the James Webb telescope to minus 400 degrees Fahrenheit, 40 degrees Celsius above absolute zero, or the telescope would dominate the, the infrared photons and every picture would be with fog over it. So we couldn't do that. So we had to develop new detectors, new kinds of detectors to detect infrared light, new avionics. Uh, ASIC is application specific integrated circuit, but it's a custom circuit. And all of these things have to operate at minus 400 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. To do that, we had to develop a tennis court size sun shield, an umbrella, to block sunlight so the telescope could cool. And you'll see that. Um, we couldn't build a seven meter or six and a half meter mirror and fit it into a rocket. So we had to come up with a transformer origami scheme to fit in there. And that meant instead of having one big mirror, we have 18 individual mirrors, all that are about this big, hexagonal shape. And they have to be at minus 400 degrees Fahrenheit as well. And we have to learn how to then take those mirrors and align them all so that they make the exact shape we want I know, remember that Hubble error? We have to make sure we don't have a Hubble error too. So we, had, we decided to make the mirrors adjustable and bendable so we could fix anything like that. Um, why did we build James Webb? We wanted to see what are those first stars and galaxies in the universe. We want to study planets and the origin of life, that thin line of light around the planets. We want to study that to see, you know, is that planet habitable? Uh, the assembly of galaxies, how did those first weird looking SpongeBob galaxies get to be beautiful spirals? And the birth and death of stars and planets uh, throughout our galaxy. So James Webb is a very different looking telescope. Light comes in, bounces off the mirror, off a secondary, and into the scientific instruments. Um, but it has no tube around it. It's open. Um, the temperature of the universe is 2.78 degrees above absolute zero. And so if you have uh, a telescope that's sitting out in deep space, no stars around it, no Earth, no astronauts, it will start cooling until it gets to that temperature. Now, if you have electronics inside that generates heat, it will never get down to that temperature. But that's the principle. So this is six and a half meters across, 18 segments, and we want all of this to cool. And what happens to structures when you cool them? They shrink. And so you have to design the structures 
so that it, at the temperature you build them in the manufacturing, they're the wrong shapes and they're too long and all of that, and predict that when they all cool, they'll be perfect. Now, we actually took at Johnson Space Center, chamber A, the big chamber that we had the command module test in, a vacuum chamber, outfitted it to be cold chamber, and built the telescope, put it in there, and tested it to make sure that all of these things would work. But think about the mirrors. The mirrors are actually uh, 1.5 meter point to point solid beryllium, which is super toxic to machine, um, very hazardous. Fortunately, we got some EPA waivers, um, or they were done, you know, very carefully, of course. But you have to grind them to the wrong shape intentionally because you, you grind them, you know, this is a machine that, you know, polishes and grinds to the room temperature shape. And you use a computer to predict what shape that should be such that when you cool it 400 degrees Fahrenheit, it bends to the right shape. And we thought, okay, we'll do that and then we'll measure it cold and then warm it back up. And by the measurements cold, we'll figure out how much more we have to grind or if we just screwed it up totally and start again. And amazingly, the computer forecast of what the shape should be was almost right on. This, the colors here mean it's either too high or too low compared to the perfect surface. And this says 100 nanometers full scale. So we're talking about still tiny little bits. A nanometer is 10 to the minus nine meters, uh, nine zeros. Um, and uh, so this is a really bad mirror, but it, this is at normal temperature, room temperature. When we then cool it, the scale goes to 20 full scale, and the biggest change is just a few nanometers. I mean, we're talking about the size of atoms, you know, individual layers of atoms of metal on the surface. And we got it right the first time on almost all the mirrors. Um, you know, really uh, miraculous. Now, we, as I said, we tested it at cold temperatures. This is the Marshall Space Flight Center uh, X-ray facility. And this gives you, a, that's a person, a normal size person. I think that's about 5'8". And uh, this is just some of the mirrors. And so we actually tested them at cryo to make sure they're the right shape. And you know, somebody in a meeting told me, you know, these are the smoothest mirrors ever made, which is really the start of a joke, right? So, you know, so uh, those are the smoothest mirrors ever made. You're supposed to say, how smooth are they, <laughs> right? OK, I'm a, I'm a nerd. What can I say? <laughs> so I sit in my office one day thinking, how do I describe this? And I said, well, what if I stretch one of these mirrors to the size of the United States? I mean, it's a thought experiment. You know, what if one of these mirrors was the size of the United States? Well, I'm a mountaineer. Um, you know, I like to climb 14ers in Colorado. They're 14,000 feet above sea level. Um, we're pretty close to sea level here. If we wait 50 years, we'll be below sea level. <laughs> and if you stretch one of these James Webb mirrors to the size of the United States, the mountains are two inches tall. That's how smooth it is. I mean, it really is incredible. Um, now, that also means that if a bacteria falls on the surface, an E. coli, it's huge. It's over 100 times bigger than that. And we certainly have lots of bacteria that were on those mirrors and probably made it to space. I think they're dead now. Um, <laughs> Now, I told you about the origami uh, transformer thing. To fit in the Ariane 5 launch vehicle, we had to fold it all up. This is the sunshade. It had two wings that folded out. Then they unfolded. Then they unfolded again. And then, uh, like sailboat rigging, pulled them out with little uh, individual tension lines, hundreds of tension lines all around, pulleys, motors, booms. Uh, it's like putting out a spinnaker, if any of you are sailors. Uh, and then there's five individual layers, none of which can touch. And they will separate, again, driven by all these motors. And this has to work. If this doesn't work, the telescope is no good. None of the rest matters. Um, it's about SPF 1 million. I think it's 1 million per layer. Um, and that blocks the sunlight so this can cool. Everything up here can cool. Um, now, the solar wind pushes against all of this because of the size of a tennis court. So we have a trim tab, again, a sailing thing. And then the sides of the telescope folded out, the secondary folded out, we extended it. It's a million miles from Earth at this weird point called the Lagrange point two, whereas the Earth goes around the sun, the gravity from the sun and the Earth balance out here to drag it with the Earth. So it's always at the same place with respect to the Earth-Sun line. 
So that's the James Webb Space Telescope. Looks very different, um, but it, it had about 320 mechanisms that all had to work perfectly, not redundant. We didn't have two mechanisms in case one failed, single mechanisms. They all had to work perfectly or the telescope wouldn't function. And I'm just amazed uh, that they worked. When we tested, there's about 100 actuators, um, doesn't matter really what the technology is, that helped with this deployment of the, solar, of the sun shield. And the first time we tested, 30% failed. Um, well, so, you know, there you go. And uh, so fortunately, they worked through all of that. that you know, that part of that's why, you know, it's a $5 billion observatory. The other $5 billion, I think, is mismanagement. But, um, <laughs> but I, I left after four and a half years. So what can I say? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I'm going to skip through that. We have four main instruments. We have two cameras, a near-infrared camera, and, and this one is more like you know, what you can put on your iPhone and look at hot people, and then a mid-infrared imager that sees even cooler things, uh, so longer wavelengths of infrared light. And this is the one that we'll be able to see the most distant parts of our universe. Because if you imagine an ultraviolet photon, a wavelength of light that's in the ultraviolet, beyond violet, beyond blue, um, from very hot stars, and the first stars in the universe are probably very hot, it has a really small wavelength, okay? But as it travels through the universe, the universe is expanding, so it's like a slinky. You start expanding that, and by the time it gets to Earth, 13.8 billion years later, it's now an infrared photon, because light has been stretched out to longer wavelengths, and that's why we needed these. And then you'd really like to break up the picture that you look at instead of just red, green, blue, three colors. You want to break it up into lots and lots of colors because that allows you to do the physics, to understand why, how the object works, what chemical elements are producing the light, and spectrometers do that. This is the Earth as seen from the Voyager spacecraft uh, far out into our solar system, and it's just a pale blue dot, as Carl Sagan said. And this is dust in the plane of our solar system, dust left over from the formation of the planets. Um, Jupiter is our, our Dyson vacuum cleaner. It vacuums up a lot of that. Um, so when we look at the solar system now, it looks, you know, with your eye and with telescopes, it looks pretty clean. But if you do a long exposure edge on, you can see there's still a lot of dust left, just like your Dyson vacuum cleaner. But if we take that light and break it into its component colors, here's Ultraviolet, we can't see ultraviolet. Here's violet, the visible wavelength. Then visible infrared uh, is sort of a misnomer, but it's the transition from the reddest red that we can see to the infrared we can't, and then the near infrared that we can't see. And if you break light into its component colors uh, very finely, ch chop it all up, and look at the intensity at each color, you get this wiggly line. And each of these dips is the physics. So our atmosphere, so this is lit by the sun, but some of that sunlight is absorbed by water vapor, and so the intensity goes down. Um, some of the light is absorbed by plants on the surface in reflection, and that's the, by chlorophylls, so the light goes down. Um, oxygen and ozone absorb light. Carbon dioxide absorbs light. Methane absorbs light. And so we can look at this wiggly line and say, ah, I know that the Earth's atmosphere has water vapor, oxygen, ozone, carbon dioxide, methane. And this is a simulation. If you look at the actual Earth wiggly line, you can see that we have sulfur dioxide from volcanoes. You can also see industrial gases. You can see pollution. If, if there's an intelligent species at Alpha Centauri with a slightly bigger than James Webb telescope looking at us, they know that our atmosphere has all of these components, oxygen. We, they know we're a rocky planet. They know that there's methane and carbon dioxide, which means something has to be producing that carbon dioxide regularly, plants. They see the industrial pollution. And if they've been doing this for, say, 100 years, they see the pollution rising. They can actually measure the temperature of our atmosphere and see it's rising. So they would actually know that there is a technological species on planet Earth by observing with a telescope not imaging just the point of light and breaking it up into all its colors. 
And so they would conclude that there's a technological civilization. They would also rule out an intelligent civilization. <laughs> um, but, you know. So James Webb Space Telescope really covers this near infrared, uh, sorry, the, uh, it really is near infrared out to, I didn't show it, the mid infrared. And the mid infrared is where in, you start getting to larger complex molecules. It was launched on December 25th, 2021, Christmas Day, great Christmas present. And it was launched by an Ariane 5 launch vehicle that was part of the European Space Agency contribution. James Webb is a US, Canadian, European Space Agency collaboration. Um, they also built a couple of the instruments. Um, this is James Webb heading off before it's done all of its deployments. Uh, we had a requirement for a five-year fuel lifetime, a desirement uh, for an 11-year lifetime, that was our predict, if the Ariane 5 gave us a very precise boost to that Earth-Sun weird point. Um, you know, if it was a little off, we'd have to use fuel to get back on trajectory. And they were so close to the exact specification of the trajectory out to Earth-Sun L2 that we needed that we barely needed but a couple of puffs of propellant for course correction and we have 20 years of propellant on board. And we may learn how to manage it even more carefully and get a little bit more. So that's good news. Five years compared to a Hubble 33 seems really short. So each of the mirrors at launch was not aligned correctly, deliberately. And so when we first turned on the telescope, we had eight and looked at one bright star we had 18 individual bright stars. And we did that so that we could identify which mirror was associated with which image of a star and then adjust them so they all came into a single star. And so that's what you see here. This is a very bright star uh, that we used for calibration. And unlike Hubble, which has the cross, you see you know, the, all of these other diffraction spikes, six, and that's because the hexagonal mirrors also cause light to diffract, to scatter. And so this is characteristic of a James Webb image. And this was proof that the telescope is in focus, the shape is right, we actually didn't have to bend any of the mirrors, and that we could align 18 mirrors to operate as one telescope. What we should have expected, and probably people did, is that if you build a big telescope like this and it is in focus, in the background, you're gonna image lots of other things too, even though this was a really short image, picture, short exposure. And in the background are all these galaxies, thousands of galaxies actually. In fact, that image would have resulted probably in 100 PhDs 50 years ago or, or less. And so these are just some of the galaxies in a 30 minute exposure uh, in the background of that calibration exposure. You know, the galaxies everywhere. Um, this is a picture of uh, Jupiter with the Hubble Space Telescope. We're very familiar with this. This is 2021. This is with that uh, super duper digital camera, the wide field camera three we put in. Amazing detail. We can actually watch you know, features traveling across in these bands from the high velocity winds. You know, here's some of the same von Kármán type, von Kármán type vortices uh, that are created due to actually a differential uh, rotation, the great red spot. Um, Here's the James Webb image. Now remember, we can't see the infrared light. Um, from Hubble, we can translate you know, Hubble images to red, green, blue that we look like. We try and make this look as close as possible to what you would see through color-wise through a telescope. James Webb, you can't do that. So they pick different colors to associate the different wavelengths of light. And you can see different things in the, ultravi in the uh, infrared. Um, you can see through some layers that you couldn't see with Hubble. Some things block light you couldn't see with Hubble. And if you zoom out a little bit, uh, because of the sensitivity, here we can see Jupiter's rings, which are very hard to see uh, with Hubble. You can see some tiny moons. Um, you can see aurora. Jupiter has a, m a really massive magnetic field. So just beautiful pictures. And of course, there's stars and galaxies in the background. Um, this is a uh, star forming region called the Carina Nebula from HST, uh, again, this is the gas and dust. You know, it doesn't look like super high resolution, but it is, it's just that, you know, the universe, the, the detail isn't all that fine uh, in these clouds of gas and dust as seen by Hubble. Here's a, uh, a baby star that's been born and has started to blow out the bubble around it. 
Remember, we looked something like this when our sun was formed, but the solar wind, the pressure from our uh, sun has pushed out the bubble. So here's a star. Inside of here, a baby star is probably born inside of that little point. And the reason why we have this line is some of the newer stars uh, that have been born that are like 100 million years old, their ultraviolet light is hitting this cloud and boiling off the gas. So not only do stars push the gas out, um, but other stars, their ultraviolet light boils off the gas until eventually this will all be gone. And, and you know, I mean, if we just wait around a few million years, we'll be able to see those baby stars and, and planets. Here's the James Webb image. Let me go back for a moment. This is, look at this little peninsula. Here's that peninsula on James Webb. And now we can see a lot more detail and inside of, and, and in some cases through uh, this image. So we're seeing you know, much of the stars and the material inside. Some of this is so dense that even the infrared light can't get out. But also it's, it's just an incredibly beautiful picture. Here's the Hubble image. And then here's going further into the infrared and you can start to see even more. This is with the mid-infrared instrument. Um, I want to talk about planets. I mentioned that picture of the Earth and the sunrise. This is an artist's conception of a planet called WASP-39b. Um, WASP is the name of the observatory. This is the 39th star system. It's found planets around. And B means it's the second planet out uh, from that solar system. And the way we study these is if you imagine a planet orbiting a star, but let's say its geometry is just so that between uh, the line of sight, the planet goes in front of the star, then of course it goes behind it. When the planet goes in front of the star, the rocky part of the planet blocks the starlight, <coughs> and so the light goes down. And at the bottom, when the planet is right in front of the star, some of the starlight goes through the atmosphere of the planet around the star. Again, that's that thin blue line. So here's the starlight. Some of it's blocked. And then the star goes back outside and it goes back up. So here's the bottom. And if you break it into three colors, you see that the different colors of light are absorbed differently. Remember I told you atmospheres uh, absorb different colors based on what they're made out of? So we can do that analysis. And again, it's just looking through that thin sliver. Now Hubble has done this. The blue line is what a uh, physicist models that that wiggly line should look like. And the dots are Hubble data here and Spitzer Observatory out here. And the claim is that, OK, well, the, the theorist, the physicist says there should be a bump here due to sodium if there's sodium in the atmosphere. And sure enough, Hubble sees an excess of sodium. Hydrogen and helium here, potassium here, bumps due to water in the atmosphere. So this is one of the first planets we discovered, water vapor in the atmosphere of a planet around a nearby star. And this is the infrared out here. Now, we can't really claim we have any detections of water vapor out here or of carbon dioxide because you know, these data points you know, don't really mean anything. The data is not good enough. So here's James Webb. So now that's carbon dioxide line, um, and we're zooming in on the wavelength. You know, we have amazing data because we can collect more light with the bigger mirror in the infrared. And sure enough, you know, carbon dioxide. So we have water vapor and carbon dioxide. They don't see methane. This is actually a planet that's way too hot to support life, uh, unless there's like molten silicon life or something. We have no idea, but the surface. Um, this is an HST image of something called Stefan's Quintet. It was a birthday image, anniversary image many years ago. There's five galaxies. Uh, this is a very distant galaxy. This one's closer than these two, or this one. These two are merging. This is one of those galaxy collisions. And in the center of each of those galaxies, and almost every galaxy, is a supermassive blast hole with millions of times more mass than our sun. And these two are doing a cosmic dance, and they're going to swirl around each other. And the two black holes in the middle eventually are going to merge and make an even bigger black hole. And stars are going to get sucked in. And it's going to produce lots of energy. Um, and so this is the Hubble image. And there, there are other, many other galaxies you can see in the background. You know this is the Hubble image. Why? Here are these crosses, right? That's, these are stars in our own galaxy that make those little star spikes. 
And here's the James Webb image. And you can see different things. Here you can see much more into this galaxy where stars are forming and the gas and dust that forms those stars. You can see the black holes better. Um, this one you can, is still kind of blurry. It's quite distant. You can see more of the spiral details and where the gas and dust is. But the squiggly line thing again. We can look with James Webb. Oh, and here's the six, so you know it's James Webb. We can look at just the light from these black holes and do the squiggly line thing. So that's what James Webb can do that Hubble can't do as well. And we can see that in those black holes, there's ion and argon and neon and sulfur and oxygen. Um, in this one, we see silicates, which are neon, magnesium, and silicon uh, with um, group. And all of those chemical elements are what we're made out of, not neon. We don't have very much neon or argon. But if you're a welder, you want lots of argon. And if you like neon signs, you want neon signs. I mean, this is how the universe was formed, was this kind of weird dance and black holes and you know, ejecting gas out that forms new stars. In fact, to account for us being here today and the breakfast you ate this morning, we had to go through two and a half supernova explosions. You know, the creation of stars, the destruction of stars, the gas coming back together, forming new stars. And each time, the chemical elements, remember the universe started with hydrogen, helium, and lithium. Um, if all we had was hydrogen, helium, and lithium, we don't all talk like this because of the helium. But life would never have formed because you need calcium for your bones, iron for your blood. If you look at a vitamin bottle, you know, it says selenium, you know, which is you know, created in supernova explosions. And the marketers say you need it. And actually, we do. It's, it, it's a critical uh, component of a molecule that's a critical enzyme, uh, part of our immune system. Um, Going even deeper into the universe, this is a seven and a half hour image, a deep exposure. Hubble stared at this scene for seven and a half hours. This is a star in our own galaxy. Everything else are, are really, even every speck, are really distant galaxies. This is a satellite going through the field of view, maybe a Starlink. Um, here's the James Webb image. Now, this is a bigger picture, but it's just phenomenal. Twelve and a half hours, so it's longer. Um, but the first deep field that we took, you know, the great deep field after the Hubble repair was an 11 day time exposure. 11 days of Hubble time was spent staring at one spot in the sky. We can do that in about four hours with James Webb now, just because it's a bigger mirror. It sees different things, but th the same galaxies in different colors. Really amazing. And again, the same trick. We can look at each of those specks, zoom in on them. So this is what they look like. And here's one galaxy, it's very misshapen. You know, the universe hadn't had time yet to build these nice spiral galaxies. Um, and you know, here we see hydrogen, which we expect, and oxygen. 11.3 billion years, you know, we'd already had a bunch of stars that had formed, created oxygen, and blown up. Um, down here, 13.1 billion years. And Hubble is seen even further back. And again, we see hydrogen and oxygen. So the stars form much earlier in the universe than we expected before we launched James Webb, and we haven't figured out why. It's a big mystery. Remember the dark ages and coming out. Um, this, this particular galaxy, 13.1 billion years old, Hub uh, James Webb's not big enough to really see it in great detail, so it's just this blob. But we see oxygen, neon, hydrogen, and all these lines, and we can uh, really start to study those very first stars and galaxies. Um, here's some more. Uh, this is the furthest known galaxy that we've currently seen, and Jam all it will take is James Webb to look longer, uh, and I'm sure we'll see even more. Um, this is a picture of a, another star-forming region, 30 Doradus. Um, it's nearby our Milky Way it's in, in the Magellanic Clouds, and here's the James Webb picture. And again, just the beauty and grandeur of our universe and the richness and texture. Um, you, know, you can imagine flying through through this in spaceship, Starship Enterprise. <laughs> um, we can take those images, you know, break them up into their colors and see different things. Hydrogen, uh, that's just a proton, molecular hydrogen, H2, a little bit colder, and hydrocarbon dust. We're actually seeing organic molecules that form just naturally due to carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen forming in clouds the building blocks of what we're made out of. And not only that, we can do the squiggly line thing. 
We've looked at Titan, a moon of Saturn. Um, we can see its clouds. We can see the surface in different colors. And in uh, 2034, we're going to land a, uh, a drone on the surface that's going to fly around with instruments that are going to look for organic molecules because Titan is a model of the early Earth. We actually see lakes and rivers and mountains on Titan. But instead of water as the solvent, they have ethane, uh, a hydrocarbon. Um, so those science themes that I showed you, the first light and the looking at the very distant universe, check. Gravitational lenses, interaction of galaxies, check. Uh, watching planets and the origins of life, check. Molecules, star formation, check. So just in the commissioning and the first year of observations, uh, James Webb is already transforming our universe, and, and that's just the beginning. This is the Eagle Nebula Pillars of Creation from James Webb. Um, so I'm very excited about that. All of these images for Hubble, for James Webb, are on webtelescope.org and hubblesite.org, respectively. And uh, thanks for coming. I'm happy to answer any questions. Yes. No, it, it's just an unbelievable story, actually, but it, but it happened. So we, uh, NASA, not we, um, actually, uh, just as a way of background, I started out uh, my professional career as an X-ray astronomer and gamma ray ast astronomer, so very high energy, super high energy <coughs> stuff, black holes, neutron stars. I was fascinated by neutron stars. And uh, we were working on the Compton Observatory, the next great observatory, at the launched by the space shuttle, and would have been a complete failure unless Jay Apt and Jerry Ross, and Jerry Ross specifically, pulled the high gain antenna out because it didn't deploy properly. And you know the manufacturer, uh, at that time, uh, not Northrop Grumman, they bought, uh, bought them. Um, TRW. TRW, thank you. TRW said, oh, there was just a little interference with the multi-layer insulation. Jerry told me he pulled as hard as he could in a spacesuit. And Jerry Ross, if you've met him, he's a yeah. burly guy. So anyway, um, but so I sort of thought, why is all this money going into Hubble? You know, we, we should, anyway. But I'm now a big Hubble fan, Hubble hugger, uh, as you can tell. Um, but they knew they had to do a test. Now, I'm told that on the classified side of the house, They'd already gone through this exercise of finding out that there's spherical aberration and you have to do a test. And the NASA side knew we had to do a test, and we did. And Perkin Elmer that built the optics had a machine that grounds the mirror, and it's very complicated to get the right shape. Telescopes, mirrors are hard to get perfect shape because you're in a basically a machine shop with a tower that has a grinder with a, a wheel on it. And you're going around, and the wheels are sometimes you know, big, like the size of that table. And they go around the mirror, and they're taking off glass um, until you get to the right shape. And so somehow you have to know how to drive the machine that gets that shape. And there's no mirror, there's no s reflective coating. It's just glass. Um, and so there's, you know, we've learned over those, you know, 300 plus years how to do that, and a lot of precision involved. And as part of that, there's a thing at the top of the tower that holds that grinder that has a series of precision components, and they determine the shape of the mirror. And periodically, you stop and me measure it. Nowadays, we do it with lasers very accurately. Um, but in the case of Hubble, there was a sequence of washers, um, and some of them were flat, and some of them were curved, and that determined the shape of the mirror. Accidentally, one of those washers was put in upside down. I mean, and when I say curved washer, I mean it's a slight curvature. You know, they should have etched in up and down or something like that. But somebody assembled it. They had a procedure. They had quality assurance to verify it, and the technician put the washer in, and it was one of them was upside down, and that caused the flatness of the mirror slightly. 
ever so slightly. Now, another company built a test rig to measure the curvature to make sure it was right. And again, that's a very hard thing to do. You know, it's a big mirror. You want to bounce the light off, go up to a, a surface. You know, nowadays we do it with uh, interferometers and lasers and zygos and all kinds of weird things. Um, and you know, similar techniques were used for Hubble. But uh, if you're measuring the curvature of the mirror, you have to have a reference to see is it the same as we expect. And the independent contractors still, you know, none of the same people, but the engineers all, you know, are optical uh, scientists and studied the same textbooks and all of that. So the rig that measures the curvature also used a series of washers, and somebody put one in upside down. I mean, you just you couldn't write this, uh, you know, in a space force comedy, right? Um, and so th it looked correct, and it wasn't until we got to orbit. Um, so, th you know, thank goodness that we built a space shuttle and the Hubble that was designed to be upgraded. In fact, if any of the missions hadn't occurred, we wouldn't have a Hubble today, just because things would have broken, Hubble would have gone out of repair. Um, you know, if we didn't have the first servicing mission, Hubble would have only been a five-year mission because it wasn't that good a telescope. Um, if we hadn't have rescued it in 1999, that would have been the end of it. If we hadn't have fixed it in 2009, well, if in 2002, if we hadn't put new solar rays and fixed the power control unit, it would have lasted another five years, so 2007. If we hadn't have fixed it in 2009, uh, it probably would have only, because of batteries and other things, might have made it to 2015, but no longer. So, you know, really remarkable. Uh, the most capable system, the space shuttle system was just incredible. Yes? question is, what are the virtues of beryllium that caused us to use it for the James Webb Space Telescope? It's really lightweight, super lightweight. You know, the periodic table is hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium. The other is that at low temperatures, this minus 400 degrees Fahrenheit, if you go to 410 degrees Fahrenheit minus a co little colder, or 390, James Webb is actually around 390. So if you go 390 to 400, the coefficient of thermal expansion at those temperatures is such that it doesn't change size very much at all. And so it's stable at cold temperatures. Very few metals are like that, but also it's extremely light. But seriously, I, I don't know if we could build another beryllium telescope with the health hazards and, and the regulations today. It'd be very difficult. Yes? So the question is, uh, you know, Hubble was the ire of late night shows and comics, Congress, taxpayers, uh, with the aberration and the cost overruns and the delays. All you know, Hubble was supposed to launch in '86. Of course, we lost Challenger. Um, Hubble wouldn't have been ready. You know, so the, the time to 1990 was was important. Um, James Webb, big success, big cost. I don't hear anybody complaining about the cost of Webb now that it's so spectacular and it did work. And I think uh, the question is, has Webb sort of gotten this goodwill for whatever the next telescope is? And I think the answer is yes. But I'll, I'll couch that in another way, which is, you know, if uh, you know, you're a, a space audience, so asking you, you know, the names of the astronauts currently on the ISS, you know, is not representative of the American public. So if we go out on, you know, Central Park and ask people, do they love NASA? You know, virtually everybody loves NASA. If you start saying, uh, what do you love about NASA? Most will point to Hubble Space Telescope, the Curiosity Perseverance rover on Mars, the Ingenuity helicopter, you know, maybe Galileo going out to Jupiter or Cassini at Saturn. Um, if you say, you know, well, what about the human spaceflight program? Um, you know, and the first person to land on the moon, they'll go, oh yeah, I love Louis Armstrong. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, we gotta work harder on that. 
And again, James Webb is the one we should look to. When we go back to the moon, if we go back to the moon and you know, bounce around a lot and plant an American flag and say, hey, we beat the, the Chinese and we come back and we don't have a, a sound science program, you know, we'll, we'll get to Artemis 7 and that'll be the end of it. And so we, you know, we need to make sure that we go there and, and do good science. Yes? I've just finished up a uh, STEM astronomy STEM kit for my civil air control squadron. And there's so much out there to share with them through the web, with Hubble. And I think they're fascinated by it. But I'm an engineer, not an astronomer. And I'm trying to get them to understand the, the, the incredible science around them. Do you have any suggestions for me that make it easier for them? They're, when you're talking about uh, middle school, early high school, Go to Web Telescope and Hubble site.org and go to the education tab. And there's incredible amounts of material. And at the bottom, you'll see a contact at Space Telescope Science Institute. It's one of the, the groups that I ran when I was deputy director. We have a STEM education group that develops curriculum components that you can uh, either download or, uh, in some cases, you know, you get. And, you know, you can invite one of the educators from Space Telescope to come and talk to your Civil Air Patrol group. Let's do that. Thank yeah, the question was, you know, how do I get, you know, materials to help students, middle school students, uh, learn about all these kind of things. And interestingly, uh, I'll tell two stories. Uh, one of which is, you know, we at Space Telescope have a very broad portfolio. I mean, we have uh, images that are translated from the visual images into Braille so that people who no longer have sight can at least feel the images in different colors and you know the brain gets rewired and so they actually really enjoy that and the, you know we have a lot of uh, folks from 20 years of war in the Middle East that you know went overseas you know with great sight and have come back without sight and they, in particular our wounded warriors are are enjoying these images um, but we, we look at everything uh, from STEM education in middle school, for instance, in science classes, but we also write, have people writing stories so that in uh, you know, English class, in reading class in middle school, uh, stories about scientists and the Hubble Space Telescope and sort of, sort of stealth science um, that goes into those curriculum materials. Now, of course, in Florida, those are banned, but <laughs> elsewhere. <laughs> Uh, elsewhere, you can read about that um, in, in science. And so, I th anyway, so I think that's a great resource. Yes? So, I heard you say that the American Indian is brilliant. Um, when you go from a hot to a cold in class, it tends to break. So, how long does it take to go from the hot temperature to the cold temperature? And how does that affect the mirror of your system? The temperature? Yep. So, the, everything was designed to be cooled, and as soon as that sun shield was deployed, the telescope started cooling off. So that was, you know, in the first two weeks. To get down to the lowest temperature um, took several more weeks, very, very slow. And all the carbon fiber had to shrink. Um, the, also, we know that when you build carbon fiber, even in a clean room, it absorbs some water, and that water comes out in space. And actually, the, like the big structure that's going to change shape over the next five to ten years very, very slowly. So we'll have to adjust the focus a little bit. Um, but all these changes are slow. They were predicted. They were tested in Johnson. So we cooled it off. It took about two weeks to cool off, about two weeks to warm back up in the chamber test. And by doing it so slowly and by having, again, brilliant scientists and engineers who designed these things, we built in, we designed in the accommodation of the stresses that occur as you cool something. I mean, uh, I'm amazed. Uh, I make hummingbird food, right? So you take your Pyrex two-cup uh, measuring cup, and you pour in a bunch of sugar, and you pour in water, um, and you pour in boiling hot water so the sugar uh, dissolves, and the Pyrex doesn't crack. You know? And so it goes from room temperature to boiling temperature instantly, well, not instantly, but very fast as you pour the boiling water, and it doesn't crack. Well, ground-based telescopes are made out of Pyrex, a similar glass to Pyrex, a borosilicate glass to Pyrex, so that they're 
relatively, they don't shrink very much with temperature changes or expand in that case with temperature changes. And so the telescope was designed similarly, so it's the Pyrex of super cold. Yes? So the question is, uh, can the Webb telescope uh, detect uh, CFCs in the atmospheres of planets around nearby stars? Um, in, I, I haven't looked into that specifically, but s relatively small organic molecules, uh, yes, it will be able to detect. Um, CFCs, I don't know what the chemical formula is, um, but uh, CFCs, as far as we know in the known universe, are only produced by industrial societies. And the CFCs in our atmosphere, even though they destroy the, the ozone in our upper atmosphere, ozone hole, are still at such trace amounts that I'm not sure CFCs specifically are detectable. Uh, now with a sufficiently large telescope and close by, looking at the Earth, you would be able to see those, but I'm not sure. Uh, so if we see with James Webb and its s uh, six and a half meter mirror, if, if uh, 10 light years away we see a planet with CFCs, then nature has figured out a way to build CFCs. And that's just extraordinarily unlikely. Fluorine is, is a weird chemical so, and also very nasty. John David. So the question is, you know, this complex origami transformer deployment just looks too cockamamie to, uh, to work. So did we have any plans so that if it didn't, we could go and do something else? And I worried a lot about that. And I'll give you my five bucks later for asking the question. <laughs> um, and so when I took over in 20, uh, I had worked on this for a couple of years. In 2012, I said, okay, now I'm the boss. I can fix this. <laughs> and I said, I want to put a small grapple fixture. Um, and I actually had a grapple fixture out of titanium from the Canadian Space Agency that they were space qualified in bonded storage, uh, for those of you who are space geeks, um, that weighed 0.44 kilograms, required three titanium screws to go to the spacecraft. And it was for Orbital Express programs, so it had a, a pin that you would grab with a spring system so you wouldn't disturb the telescope when you grab it. I wanted to put that on the spacecraft and then some targets so you would know how to dock. And I thought, we can build a little spacecraft, I mean, like this big, which is the size of Orbital Express, that could zip to James Webb, grab it, and inside it would just have a motor and a weight, and it would just gently shake it as you command whatever didn't work. Um, and the project manager at that time said, if you make me put that on, I quit. <laughs> and I said, why? And he said, because you won't stop there. The next thing you're going to tell me, I got to replace instruments and refuel it. And so um, I did manage to get targets on it. But if it had not deployed, if it had only partially deployed, then let's say half of it came out. Um, but it, it, you know. It had to fold up completely first to separate the layers, but you would have a differential heating. You'd have the sun on one side of the telescope, shade on the other part starting, and then you're in a bad situation that after a few weeks there would be enough distortion that the other mechanisms wouldn't go. So it had to work just as it planned the first time, and you only have a couple of weeks. You know, I said, well, we'll have this other thing on to go, and if we don't need it, you know, the $10 million it would take to develop would be the cost of insurance. But that, you know, there was no 
I mean, no appetite. I mean, we had a $9 billion telescope with no insurance policy. And so I thought 10, 100 million would have been cheap. It's a good question. But it all worked. So, um, otherwise, I'd be standing here showing you the uh, fault analysis team's <laughs> results and saying, I told you so. <laughs> Any other questions? Going once. That's, so the question is, uh, for the moon, we sort of isolated the astronauts, other than transferring out of the capsule and, and the frog men at that time and transferring them to the deck and then into the astro van. Um, and, you know, I mean, yeah, it's an interesting question, what if there's life on the moon, but you know, we prop, you know, we pretty much could rule that out on a scientific basis, but it seemed a prudent thing to do, uh, just in case. Um, for Mars, indeed, uh, three and a half billion years ago, or 3.8 billion years ago, about the time we believe life started on Earth, Mars was a habitable planet with a thick atmosphere, puffy clouds, uh, snow-capped peaks, rivers, lakes, salty seas, organics, all of the ingredients you need to start life. And we have a mystery on Earth because of plate tectonics. You know, all of our old, almost all of our old rocks from that period have been subducted into the core and then uh, back as continental crust. So we don't know how life started on Earth. We don't know if it started at the bottom of the oceans or in warm, salty seas. We just, you know, all we know is if we use, you know, genetics and look back, it seems like there was one last universal common ancestor from which all life on Earth originated around 3.8 billion years ago. Mars was habitable back then, and indeed, there was a thing called the late heavy bombardment where meteorites w were hitting the Earth, hitting Mars, blasting stuff into space. We exchanged things with Mars, and it would only take a few thousand years or less for stuff to get from one to the other. And we've shown that tardigrades and, which is complex life, but single-celled organisms can survive that trip. Uh, from one planet to another inside of a, of a rock. And so we could have seeded Mars with early life, or Mars life could have seeded Earth with early Mars life. We could be Martians. We just don't know. <laughs> and that's one of the reasons to go to Mars, look for signs of life, ancient life or existing life, and see if it looks just like us. <coughs> now, that still wouldn't solve the problem. We wouldn't know whether we're Martians or whether they're Earthlings, but it, it's a fascinating question. Now, if we see life on Mars that looks completely different, that still doesn't rule it out because it could be some life on Earth that started that didn't survive, but it would be pretty compelling that it was independent start. Now, if we see life on Europa that's much further out and that is enshrouded in this ice um, in the oceans of Europa, that would be a totally different story. Nevertheless, the question is, if there's life on Mars and it's similar to life on Earth, then you know, how do we solve, first of all, the forward contamination, Earth life going to Mars and killing you know, the Mars life or, or distributing Earth life such that we'll never be able to find out if there's trace signs of ancient Mars life or astronauts coming back. Let's say you send the first crew of astronauts to Mars. And you know, on the way there, everybody's healthy. They go down to the surface of Mars. They come back to orbit. They start zipping back towards Earth, which is an eight about an eight-month traverse right now, and somebody gets sick with an exotic disease that we don't understand. What do you do, right? I mean, it's a real challenge. Do you bring them back to Earth? No, you gotta quarantine them in Earth orbit as a minimum. Um, and what if we can't figure out what it is? That, you know, that crew is destined to, to be in orbit you know, for the rest of their lives, which I think would be a pretty good deal, <laughs> um, personally. but. Uh, you know, we just, I mean, these are some of the challenges we have not properly addressed. Even, you know, we, we scrub our Mars rovers. Viking was baked to kill as much as possible. We have protocols for wiping with isopropyl alcohol. 
and keeping things bagged up. But we have transported a lot of microbes to Mars. The surface of Mars is a really hostile place. Heavy ultraviolet radiation because it has lost its atmosphere because it's too small. Cosmic radiation, um, cold temperatures, no water. You know, life on Earth really needs water to, to propagate. So there could be bacterial spores on Mars that are viable inside of these rovers, on the rovers, stuff that's fallen to the surface. But without that water and warmth and protection from UV, it, it's not going to propagate. But we have that challenge. So we do things like experiments in the Antarctic and the dry valleys where we pretend to be you know, astronauts walking around Tyvek suits and then swab things and see how bad we are, um, stuff like that. And so th those are the kind of things we have to learn. Fortunately or unfortunately, I think it's unfortunate, I don't think we're going to send people to Mars until the 2040s. Um, you know, if, if SpaceX proceeds at its current pace of testing, maybe they can get there by the 2040s. Um, but, you know, if the plan is to, to keep launching Starship uh, until it doesn't blow up, um, does that mean you're going to send a Starship to Mars down to the surface and back up 10 times to make sure that, you know, you weren't just lucky before you send people? Well, maybe that is. That's going to take a long time because it's two years to Mars. You know, if you do it 10 times, you know, it's 20 years just to test out the vehicle to make sure it's not going to blow up on one of those segments. And because of their strategy, it probably is going to blow up on multiple of those segments because that's how they learn. So, yes? Forever. Yeah, so Mars actually cannot be terraformed. Um, and there's a number of scientific papers. People make that claim because it seems simple. Uh, let's just drop, you know, uh, a million megatons. That's a 10 to the 12th megatons. First of all, we can't produce nuclear weapons like that. On the pole to Mars, melt all of that ice. The water vapor will go up into the atmosphere. Water vapor is a potent greenhouse gas. Mars will warm up. You'll have water vapor. And for a few years, you'll have an atmosphere, and then it'll go away. And then you have no more water left. Plus, you've you know, put all these uh, toxic uh, radioactive molecules, uh, atoms, all over the surface, making Mars inhab uninhabitable. Um, Mars is just simply too small to retain an atmosphere. Now, there's an enormous amount of water on Mars that we've measured in the poles, underneath the surface um, at high latitudes. If we were to melt all of the water we believe is on Mars, it would cover the entire planet by a few hundred meters. Still not that much, but um, there is water. Um, but the atmosphere is currently too thin uh, to, to try and recreate and have it last any reasonable length of time uh, so that you could then you know, grow crops and things. But I have no problem going outside in a spacesuit. I like to. And, you know, humans like, you know, surviving extreme environments. I mean, this is the miracle of, of life, on mammalian life on Earth and humans, is that even though we were never evolutionarily pressured to survive in Earth orbit, we thrive. You know, there's no guarantee of that, but it works. You know, we're incredibly adaptable. And we will probably, be of over thousands of years, we will probably adapt to be better in space. Um, so on the surface of Mars, living in pressurized habitats, living underground, uh, going out in spacesuits, building greenhouses, massive greenhouses. You have plenty of CO2 to give to the plants. Grow them in greenhouses. They produce oxygen. You use the oxygen in your habitat. Do it somewhere where there's underground water. Now you have water. Um, you know, I, I think Mars is habitable, but it's going to be in controlled controlled areas. Right, gravity. Gravity, yep. For us, yes. 
So something you know, a little bit smaller than the Earth or something one to two times the size of the Earth would retain an atmosphere that would have a pressure that you know, would support surface life like, you know, like life on Earth. And it turns out those are relatively common. So now Neptunes, Uranus and Neptune sized planets are the most common and then we're the next most common. What was predict, you know, early when planets were first discovered, 1990s, 1996 to, you know, 2005 or so, all we were seeing mostly Ju Jupiters, big Jupiters. And so, you know, theorists, you know, went and tuned their models and they said, Jupiters are the most common sized planet. Well, they're big and they're easy to spot, you know. So anyway, astronomers are, you know, prone to, you know, the same kind of, you know, cognitive bias that everybody else is. Last question, way in the back. And Hubble. Yeah, and Hubble, yes. Yep. Uh, but I'm just curious, like, if you know, find specific answers, I was curious, like, where do you see potential new avenues in, you know, the new topics of research that, that are coming in the next decade that are enabled by the data you see that, that we haven't been able to see in the past? And what sorts of questions that, that might need to be answered that we haven't been able to answer in the I'll give you my five bucks later. So, um, <laughs> So my personal area of research is Europa with Hubble. And Europa is a moon of Jupiter. It's about the size of our own moon. It's huge. And it has an icy crust that's 5 to 30 kilometers thick on top of a saltwater ocean that contains twice as much water as all the water on Earth. And at the base of that, uh, at, the, at the water mantle interface, um, we believe there's volcanism because like a squeezing a rubber ball, Jupiter squeezes Europa and heats the core, causing it to be molten. And so we have a water uh, molten rock interface, plus water going into rock has chemical reactions uh, that with especially hydrogen in the water and the rock to cre create uh, the potential uh, for catalysts for organic molecules. And we think in the Earth ocean origin of life theory that life started around volcanic vents that had nickel and iron that acted as catalysts uh, and the water and rock coming together with all the ingredients of the uh, organic molecules that seeded the early solar system and created the molecules that are needed inside of cells but inside of little rock pores and things like that. Uh, before the lipids would surround them and, and somewhere around those vents eventually life turned on. So one theory is if we see life in the oceans of Europa, uh, that would probably be an independent origin of life and that means the whole universe is filled with life. So uh, with Hubble, we've observed, uh, and this is a group I'm a part of, we've observed plumes of water coming out near the South Pole, near a crater called Pwyll uh, that Galileo saw. This is a Galileo image, but we're seeing these sprites of water. That's about 200 kilometers. Um, and if you could fly through that water and sample it, you could look for organic molecules that would be so complex that only life could create it. Um, or you might like smash into a squid and then that'd be really <laughs> cool. Um, so I've proposed to James Webb to look at those plumes with the spectroscopy and we could then see of course, water vapor or water because that's what's coming out. And if there are, this is not an observation, this is for the proposal, but if there are organic molecules, um, we would be able to see them in the mid infrared with James Webb. Uh, and so I, th you know, I think this is an exciting thing for James Webb to do. If we see this, then that gives confidence that when Europa Clipper goes there in 2030, 
that we're going to want to target those plumes. Just like Cassini spacecraft flew through the plumes under Enceladus and saw organic molecules. Anyway. All right. Lunch. Thank you.